What's going on, everybody? Welcome into episode 50 of To The Show We Go. And we have Ed Hand and myself, Andrew Parker. It's a big 5-0, and uh, this is the Chris Cotillo episode. Uh, I feel like Chris doesn't really need an intro, per se. I feel like uh, if you're on any type of social media, I feel like you know him. He's the Red Sox beat writer from Mass Live. Um, I've also seen the godfather of Red Sox Twitter. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But uh, Not Chris, a said it. what are your sources on that, Parker? Can you reveal your sources? I, I'm i going to get into that at some point, and I'm going to give Chris an, uh, a chance to kind of talk about it because I did have a question specifically on him being the bad guy of Red Sox Twitter right now for absolutely no reason. But um, you are just, you the, Is you, he the bad guy or is he the punching bag? I'm not really sure which one it is. It depends on the day. I'll tell you that. A little bit of both, I feel like. It, uh, as you said, our friend HVT, I feel like for him, he's both. All right, uh, for other people. Um, mm-hmm. It is what it is. But all right, so you you just had a surgery yourself. Um, so your, your off season has been a little interesting. But um, I guess a surgery aside, how has uh, – what have you been up to, I guess, uh, pre-getting cut open? Yeah, it's, um, you know, just waiting for the next Red Sox move to drop. There's a lot of waiting um, when that – it's kind of your job, but you know, we've tried to, you know, write more, I think than in previous off seasons. Personally, I've tried to do more of the insider stuff, which I think is evident based on me uh, just ruining the hopes and dreams of Red Sox fans by tweeting that they're either not in on somebody or that they've fallen short with another offer. Um, I'm doing the podcast, obviously Fenway rundown and been busy with that. So people, you know, I think there's this perception out there that I get a lot from family friends and people I run into that just like, well, what do you do in the off season? Do you have another job? Like you know, that's not a, not a full time job. You just must be a seasonal employee of the Red Sox, of course, which I'm not. Um, and uh, it's the, the off season's busy, even if you know they're not doing things. I think it, you know, for us on the beat, like it allows you to kind of be more flexible. Like there's no, you know, day to day chorus at this time and clubhouses at this time and your flights at this time. It's all right. What do we want to do this week on the pod? Oh, let's do a mailbag. Let's have Andrew Bailey like we did today. You know, like it's it's kind of fun in some ways. Um, and obviously, there's some days where you get completely uh, you have a plan and it gets thrown out the window. You know, I was thinking of having a quiet Saturday before New Year's a couple uh, last weekend, and Chris Sale gets traded, and all of a sudden, you know, a, a restful day is nine hours of writing and an emergency podcast. Um, we did two emergency podcasts in two hours, which is a record because we did our Giolito one too. So it's still busy, even if, you know, the Sox aren't doing much. There's still storylines, you know, like today. We uh, had a ba- had Bailey on the pod. Yovera is something we need to write about him getting moved, even though it's a smaller move. The town hall thing. Chris Smith wrote about game time. Sean and I both wrote about um, things off the Bailey podcast. So we try to keep it busy in the off season. And considering, as you referred to, I can't move or do anything. There's nothing to do other than work because my uh, I am not able to put weight on my right foot at the moment. So, um, you know, of course, as soon as I'll be able to break out of here, the Red Sox will make like three blockbuster moves because that's what it ha- how it happens. But for now, just sitting around, literally. Yeah, and I mean, you've covered a lot of just in passing there, a lot of stuff that we want to ask you about today. And uh, But I'm just going to go straight into some of these, this bigger picture stuff. No. What, what's been your interpretation of the Red Sox offseason so far? We've seen it, – it's funny because up until the Giolito signing, I think Cooper Criswell was the biggest contract that they've mm-hmm. signed, but there were a bunch of Tar trades. Ty, yeah, Tyler O'Neill. they they traded Verdugo, and then after, immediately after that they traded Sale. But there's also been that feeling that the team isn't acting like we've seen them act uh, in the mm-hmm. past, or as I think most people would say, they're not acting like a big market team. Is that would, would you agree with that assessment? And what do you think has marked this change? Also, is it even really that much of a change? Is it a change from what, um, you know, like 2015 or last year? Because I don't think it's really that different from last year, at least so far. Yeah, I think the the two big takeaways would be, number one, I was very much um, and trying to be an interest King's truther in the last couple of years because I thought that that whole moniker was overblown for a couple of reasons. Number one, every team talks to every free agent, no matter what. You know, I bet the Rays called Otani. They're not going to sign him. They, you know, that's just, that's kind of how it goes. Will you take, you know, one for 20? No? Okay, good luck with the dog, right? Like, that's kind of how... 
these things work to see if there's a fit, to see if there's some crazy thing. And so I think the thing that was working against the Red Sox in that fashion was they had a lot of needs the last few years in the free agent market. So they were talking to players across a very wide spectrum. Number two, uh, there's a lot of people who cover the team compared to some smaller markets. And so there's more leaks to those reporters. Number three, agents are more willing to say the Red Sox are in on their client as a you know, quote unquote, big market team, um, then to try to maybe drive the price up, which is a real thing and happens behind the scenes. Um, and so I was like, you know, yes, there's near, near misses every year, Eflin last year and Heaney and some of these guys. And that happens. And I thought the Red Sox were either on a streak of bad luck or, um, Heim was just kind of misreading the market. Um, with a couple exceptions, he obviously went above and beyond to sign, story compared to what he was getting on the open market at the time and obviously Yoshida a year ago now it seems like everything fits together as an ownership problem where there's a budget in place dating back to the Evaldi negotiations which I wrote about in October from last year to what we're hearing some of these offers you know come in on um come in at you know I don't know what they offered him in Naga but it was not whatever complicated deal he's getting from the Cubs Teoscar Hernandez it was around two for 28 it's not one for 23 and a half. I don't know what they offered Yamamoto. Don't know what they offered Seth Lugo. Um, like they are constrained by something that they have not copped to. And that has really dictated the entire offseason. Um, and that with the backdrop of the full throttle comment to me is very, very understandable why fans are so upset. And I get that. And I see the, you know, Red Sox fans are going to find something to complain about no matter what, even in 2018, right? But they're really, really, really pissed right now, and there's totally a reason to be. Um, and I think, you know, the other part of it is that I think Heim Bloom has been uh, one of two Red Sox people in history who I think Red Sox fans like better in death than life. And I mean that from their careers with the Red Sox, not actually. Red Sox fans like Christian Vasquez a lot more now than they did when he was on the team. And Heim Bloom, his reputation and his approval rating is going up by the day when people are starting to realize this comes from above him. You know, I think it takes a lot for fans, the public, the media to realize the buck doesn't stop at Bloom or Dombrowski or Breslow, whoever it is. It stops at John Henry, Tom Warner, Sam Kennedy. Dombrowski was able to make those moves because they opened the purse for him, right? And to an extent, you know, Bloom with Devers and Bloom with Story Yoshida, but not as much. And now, you know, they're not they're not lowballing these guys because they don't want the players. They're lowballing them because I think that there's a budget set. And I would be shocked if it got to 237. I would be almost shocked if it got to 230 or 225, which it was last year. Um, as I reported, their budget last year was 225. It was not the the, the luxury tax threshold. And that was yeah, that during any, the season, too. Do you have any theories as to why that's happening? Is it just that they've decided that they don't want to spend money? Is it that they don't think the market is any good? What's is there a, like even just like a vague idea of why they're why they're dropping the budget so much? Yeah, I mean, Nick Saban just retired, by the way, breaking news on the pod. Um, but I, I think that there is, you know, I think there's a couple things and they won't cop to it because they don't speak. You know, like they I don't know. This is the, the drum I beat all the time. They don't peel back kind of what they're thinking or what they're doing. I think that there's a twofold theory I have that is total speculation. I don't know anything about European soccer and I don't pretend to, but people have pointed out that Liverpool has gone younger and cheaper with their payroll and they're still winning. And some people think, well, maybe John Henry looks at that and says, why can't I try to do that everywhere? And part two is very related to that, where you're seeing teams around the game go out and have not the highest payroll and compete. You know, everybody knows how much money the Padres, the Mets, the Yankees, all these teams spent to not make the playoffs last year. And so the correlation is no longer there. I mean, the counter and you look at a team like the Diamondbacks making the World Series, the counter argument is, you know, the Rangers did sign Seeger and Semyon and Avaldi and DeGrom and went for Scherzer. And like, you know, I know that Scherzer and DeGrom didn't have the biggest role, but Seeger did, right? Huge free agent, huge free agent signing. Um and I do think in the game, there's just this perception from everywhere that free agents mostly are a losing cause. You know, deals look bad quickly now. Xander Bogart's deal with the Padres looks bad. And so, you know, it is understandable. I do think it would go a long way if they said, look, you know, we're at a place where we 
have, you know, good young players at, let's say, six, seven positions on the diamond, they feel probably, and pieces in the bullpen and the rotation. Um, we don't feel like we need to spend on the free agent market. Uh, and we're going to cut payroll a little bit, but we still think we're going to be competitive. Do you say that to fans? They're not as pissed as they are now thinking they're going to go full throttle because fans interpret full throttle as what? $275 million, $300 million? Montgomery, Snell, Giolito, Stroman, Yamamoto, all those guys in the rotation. You know, like that's that's just they have a perception issue that they've created. Um, you know, Alex Spear had a very interesting piece in the Globe today about their budget and how, um, you know, they have not really dropped off two years in a row under the Henry regime. Um, again, as I said, if it's 225, you know, I would be, you know, a little bit surprised, honestly, at this point for two reasons. Number one, they haven't shown a willingness. And number two, who are you going to fill out to get there? You know, like there's not that if assuming they're out of Montgomery and Snell, there's not really many free agents that you can think that they're going to get to cobble 25, 30 million more together. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot at play here. I think it's it's bigger picture. It's a lot bigger than Breslow. It's a lot bigger than the front office. And it's one of many, many reasons why, you know, John Henry and Tom Warner not talking um, is is difficult for the fan base, not for the media. People think I'm always looking for a headline when I say that, but it's not. You know, it's it's really, you know, they fans would rather just be told the truth. Red Sox fans are way too smart to be lied to with the wool over their eyes. It's just the reality of it. And uh, you might not think that if you see what they say on Twitter, but it's the reality. And and for some reason, ownership, I think, has been disrespectful to their own fan base in that way. Uh, you just dropped the biggest news on the podcast all <laughs> offseason, by the way. I That literally almost made me like spit out my water. But um, RIP to Nick Saban. But I thought he retired. He, had, he, didn't, he didn't die. He did retire. Yeah, yeah he didn't die. It, but I didn't think the guy was ever going to retire. I thought he was going to coach until he was like 95 because that's just Nick Saban. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe uh, he's going to Carolina. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Maybe uh, Vrabel's going to Alabama. I have no idea. But I just Who thought knows? he was going to coach until he was like 95. I didn't think he was ever going to leave. But we had your counterpart on uh, the other Chris at Mass Live, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Smith. Secondary, secondary Chris. He's my dad's favorite, Chris. I wouldn't. Uh, I was gonna say, Ed, I, Ed's, I wouldn't uh, uh, fight him on that. No, that's fair. Ed, <laughs> Ed likes him a lot, but and I do too. But so we had him on, uh, I think a few episodes back, and he, I've noticed one thing this past year, and he even made a trip down to Worcester, and he makes a big emphasis on writing about the prospects and all the guys coming up, and I always know that he's good for like at least a couple of week. Um, he always gets you with the headlines, everything mm -hmm. is. Is what they're doing going to make you um, appear down in Worcester at some point this year? Just because of now, I, I think with the focus, you know, like you're saying, is like they're they're wanting to just play the younger players, not spend as much. So I think the focus this year is going to be in Worcester and Portland. Are you going to start, I guess, focusing attention down there? I've been. I am a Central Mass guy. So where I'm sitting now is I recover at my parents' place in Northboro, or about 15, 20 minutes from Polar Park. So, of course, uh, I wish that they had that when I was growing up uh, instead of, you know, when I moved into Boston, obviously, they they started that. So uh, that would have been great. And it's great for the heart of the Commonwealth, as they say. It's honestly just a, you know, I went two years ago and, you know, went to a few games and did some coverage there. Like, Chris loves doing that stuff for us. Uh, he loves the minor league stuff. He knows the system way better than I do. I think one of the great ideas, and I hate giving either of them credit publicly, but Sean McAdam had when he kind of took over our coverage was, let's send Smitty to Fort Myers during instructs and literally lock him in a room and have him interview 18 prospects in three days because that's 18 cool features that we're going to get in October and November. And I was like, okay, that's, you know, like why would we go to, you know, name your city in September when they're out of it and there's nothing going on, like move that money and send him to Fort Myers. I thought it was great. And Smith did a great job because he, you know, he does a great job with those types of stories. So he has the weekly minor league notebook that goes Wednesdays. Um, and so I will, I would guess that I'll be there just because, you know, if I'm ever home during the summer, uh, it's close by 15 minutes away. Um, I'll be walking by then. So that's important. And, um, but he's, he's our minor league guru. And I think he does, you know, an incredible job, not just of a here's what scouts are saying type of thing, but kind of getting to know those guys um, 
beforehand. And we see that when a guy makes his major league debut, could be some utility infielder you've never heard of that they call up. And, you know, the traffic spikes because Smitty had a feature on him from three years ago in spring training. Uh, and so the, the headlines can be crazy. They're like Mad Libs. Um, but, you know, he, he he's, uh, he's the minor league guy for us for sure. But that doesn't preclude me. So going back to the big league club, um, a lot of the headlines recently have been more about a power hitting right-handed bat. Mm -hmm. Jorge Soler's come up a little bit, but the the last big meltdown Red Sox Twitter had was over Teoscar Hernandez. That doesn't really concern me, if I'm being totally honest. I I think that they'll be able to find hitting. Red Sox have always been able to develop hitting from within. What they haven't been able to do is develop pitching. And I'm looking at the rotation right now, and I remember back in September, Alex Cora said that Chris Sale was going to be the opening day starter. And you look at the rotation, and it's Brian Bayo, it's Nick Pavetta, it's Lucas Giolito. None of those guys scream opening day starter. None of those guys scream number one starter at this point. If you were, if you were a betting man, I don't know if you are. Uh, oh, we're yes. not sponsored by we're not sponsored by DraftKings or anything like that, so I don't have to advertise. No. Well, I am, but to a problem part point. So who who would you bet on being the opening day starter for the Red Sox? Do you think they're here right now? Or do you think it's coming from somewhere else, either trade or free agency? What 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 are your expectations? Uh, Bayo, and that was a prediction I wrote with the caveat that I think that. Uh, as we saw last year with Kluber starting, not because he was the number one in the rotation, but that's just because they how, how they lined up. I think that kind of the the glimmer of starting an opening day is off for some of these teams where they if it you know they don't want to rush Chris Sale a year ago to pitch one day earlier because of health reasons. I think something that's going to come into play this year, and this is just a guess of mine, uh, is that Brian Bayo is probably going to be their number one. And they are playing two exhibition games in the Dominican Republic in March. And I would guess that he is going to want to pitch in one of those games as one of his spring training outings as a native. If that lines up with March 28th, um, then, you know, so be it. If it doesn't, if it lines up with March 30th, you know, there's so many off days now and there's so much they can do to skip guys and throw in an opener one day that, I don't think it matters. I think, uh, you know, the, the, probably the question is, who's their number one, he probably is. And I wrote that already because I don't see you getting that guy on the trade market. Um, I don't think the cease thing is legit from everything we've heard from their side. I don't think that they are going to be in on a rental guy like Bieber or Burns. Burns has already said he doesn't want to sign an extension. If you're the Red Sox in this position, you can't do a rental starter considering what it's going to cost. Um, and I, as we've said a billion times, as Alex Spear is now writing as well, Everybody in the industry thinks they have no shot at Montgomery or Snell. So based on process of elimination, I think Bayo. And then I think they get a guy in the number two mold. My pro my projected roster, I had Lazardo. And we've heard or Sean has heard in the last few days that Miami's had cold feet about moving him, um, which is, uh, you know, something to monitor. Obviously, they have some other guys there, Cabrera, some of these other pieces. I still think they go and get a uh, pretty good controllable starter. And they empty some of the farm for it, mostly because they have to. Um, and they just at some point have to bite the bullet. And and maybe it's after Montgomery and Snell are off the market and th that market picks up a little bit. Um, so I would guess a number two comes in and they add a veteran number five. I don't know who that's going to be. You know, Alex Spear, again, has said that Paxton's unlikely. Clevenger is out there. Uh, Lorenzen is out there. I think Marcus Stroman from an off the field perspective in Boston with the issues he's had, he's gone at it with Alex Cora before not that Eckersley's here anymore. He's gone at it with him. Uh, I think that that would be a weird fit. Obviously he's, he's had issues with the Red Sox before he's had issues with the Yankees. He's talking to them. I just think Boston would be a weird fit for him. So I don't really count on that one and not just cause he went to Duke. Um, I'm not, that's not a, not a main reason why I'm downplaying it. Um, though it is a safety school. Uh, I just, uh, there, the options to me are, are limited. Um, but I do think somebody in that Lazardo mold or, you know, Seattle makes one of their four guys. I don't think Kirby or Gilbert, one of those maybe lesser guys who are still really good available. My prediction would be, you know, Bayo insert your trade guy, Crawford, uh, Giolito and a veteran. 
and push Houck and Whitlock to the bullpen. So that, you don't think Pavetta then? I think Pavetta Pavetta is the rare case where, and this is so shocking because of the way he handled both behind the scenes and publicly when I asked him the question last year about being moved to the bullpen. He's the rare guy who, despite being as pissed as he was, was so unbelievably good and wasn't shaken by that whole thing that if you have a guy on the roster who can do that, we've seen it screw up you know, Whitlock and Hauk at times, and we saw Daniel Bard's the classic example. Um, and, like, we've seen that screw up guys over time. Pavetta, if he's willing to, hey, next week you're starting, next week you're the closer, if he's willing to do that again for an entire year, like, why not just have him do that? You know, like, there, there's no downside to it. I could see him being a little more resistant to it this year because he's a free agent. Um, I would ask him, but he has me blocked on Twitter, so I can't DM him. But the, I would, I could see based on the free agency thing that being a little bit of an issue. But considering how good he was doing all of it last year, I see that type of role where you know you need a spot start. He comes back into the rotation. Ken Lee's down. He closes. Like that was extremely valuable. It kept them afloat last year, along with Chris Murphy before he really faded. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if they did you know the same type of thing. Uh, so you know. Do you want to pencil in five for opening day? We all know it takes eight, nine, or ten. Um, so that's why, you know, I, I have him probably as number six in my makeup made up projected rotation right now. Now, as far as that number two goes, do you think they'd be able to acquire that without trading one of the big three? Or do you think they're gonna have to bite the bullet and move one of Mayor, Anthony, or Kyle Teal? Yeah, someone told me that's been their white whale, is those three guys are on one side of the line and everybody else is on the other side. Uh, you know. At the same time, you know, the prices are high even without that. I mean, we've never been able to confirm this, but the rumor was that the ask from Cleveland for Savali was Rafaela at the deadline. And, like, I don't think Red Sox fans would have wanted to do that at all. You know, the Red Sox front office didn't want to do that at all. Like, Savali's not that good to get you know, to give up, you know, Rafaela and probably more. I think their dream scenario would be, you know, and I always say, Trade proposals that I see a lot of the time are like, <clears throat> you know, you putting together all the guys on your fantasy bench and putting them in your starting lineup to make them seem better than they are for a trade. Red Sox fans are like, well, York doesn't have a spot. So him, Dahlbeck, obviously him, uh, they DFA'd Yovera. We could throw him like that type of stuff. Um, yeah, so we give is... you three interchangeable parts and you right. give us your best player. <laughs> exactly. That's it's how perfect. It works. I think that the Red Sox... That? The, they can work from a place of York, I think. Abreu, I think, is a pretty good trade chip already in the majors. You have enough to cover. I think he has more value than Duran, I would guess. Rafaela really? has oh, upside. Um, you know, so like let's say Abreu, York, and maybe Hauk has value, you know, like the, the, something like that where you're talking about, you know, close to major league pieces. I think that's the way to avoid it. Um I think, you know, and Sean McAdam and I've talked a lot about this on our pod. To me, if I were to rank the untouchable rankings, number one is Teal, number two is um, Anthony, and number three is Meyer. I think if anyone gets moved from that group, it is Meyer, just because you have so much in the way of middle infield depth with Anthony. I think the upside's there, and people are obviously in love with him now. They have a lot in terms of outfield depth, and with that franchise catcher, those guys don't throw on trees. So to me, you just don't touch him. Um, but in a perfect world, they'd be able to do it with, you know, name your young outfielder from that group of three, name your young infielder from that group of, you know, York, maybe one of the first round picks from the last couple of years. Uh, Grissom might have interest from teams, you know, like that can't be ruled out, even though they view him that way as their second baseman of the future. So, you know, they have guys, you know, kind of pick from those pods. They'll probably need to include a pitcher. You know, if a team wants to take how good I would keep, you know, I would even keep Crawford almost untouchable because, you know, I know Bayo and Casas are obvious, but like Crawford, I think is pretty underrated probably because he only think, went yeah. four, four and two thirds every time. Um, but when he was out there, he was pretty good. And uh, I think teams would be calling on him, but that's, you're creating more of the problem you have if you trade him. So, um, you know, that, like I said, perfect world, like, a Brayu York pick one or two more pieces and do it. Will that be enough on this market? Probably not. So I have a two parter for you. Um, See one, if I can handle it. How, what are your thoughts on how Breslow and company have revamped the bullpen depth? And two, are there any name, new names that have been brought in via trade or free agency that you've really 
that have stuck out to you that you kind of have uh, jumped on their bandwagon? Yeah, I mean, to me, I think that they're just focused on creating competition in spring training, especially when it comes to the bullpen. And I know options is a huge thing. You know, they've been locked in for a couple of years on certain guys. You know, Brazier had such a long leash last year and, you know, they for some reason Caleb Ort had such a long leash and there's some guys that you know they should have pulled the plug on quicker and I think they have more of those options now where you know in my projection where Hoke and Whitlock are in the bullpen along with Winkowski and Schreiber and some of those guys you have you know even like Zach Kelly who a lot of people would think would make the team and did last year potentially starting a triple a along with Campbell who has options Weissert who has options um you know, Criswell, who has options like I think Castillo, like the, all the guys they're adding, they're just trying to add flexibility. It doesn't hurt to have those guys on your 40 man. Um, then to, you know, have them come up and down. There's obviously rules to, you know, the, the option rules now, I think, make it those guys even more valuable. I think the interesting thing in spring training, and they kind of made one of these decisions by DFAing Yovera because he was going to be in the same boat, is Justin Slayton, Brian Mata, carrying both of those guys on your roster to start the year kind of ruins all the flexibility that they're they're aiming for because they're effectively both rule five guys slayton is and mata's out of options um so that i think will be kind of the most interesting piece and you know cora alluded to to somebody who you know the somebody who like started the year uh in the majors last year, start the year in triple a, I think, you know, Sox prospects projection as Winkowski in triple a to start the year, which can you imagine that after the year he just had, and for a team that doesn't have much good pitching, it's surprising that it's just a weird thing. They have all these names, but nobody elite. So, um, I don't know. I haven't dug into those guys as much. I just think, you know, they have, um, you know, they're, they're basically costing nothing. They were either, you know, in the case of Campbell, he was acquired for a guy who got a non-tender, Slayton was a rule five pick for a 10th round pick who wasn't really a prospect from what I can gather. Criswell was a million dollars. Um, like you know, Castillo was a waiver claim. Like why not see what you have? It seems like they, every team hits on one of these guys a year. Uh, you know, they've kind of hit on Kelly. They hit on Schreiber before that, you know, workman came out of nowhere. Real- yeah. Bernardino. Exactly. So, um, if there was one bullpen thing I think they should do is add a veteran lefty. I think that market will probably fall apart and you can go get Matt Moore or Wandy Peralta cheap. Then it's better than, you know, something happens to Bernardino. You're focused you're on, you know, Walter Murphy, Jake's. And I think those guys, you know, all have some, sorry, Andrew. I, those, I think Jake's actually pitched pretty well, but I would rather have Wandy Peralta or Matt Moore <laughs> on my, on my team. So, um, you know, a move like that wouldn't hurt. Uh, it's okay. I mean, I saw what Joe Jakes did in Worcester and how much he meant to Paul Abbott last year. And when he got called up, Paul Abbott, it was as close to as in tears as I saw Paul Abbott Mm because he's just he's like eats nails for breakfast. So, like, I never saw him show emotion. And when he left, he's like, well, now we're screwed pretty much in the bullpen. But um, I don't know. I just I I think Joe Jakes just had a, a rough time in the majors with what he i mean he was up and down like crazy it was it was insane um ed i have some random ones but i want to see if you have anything major league side before we jump into those yeah i do have one other uh that we haven't really talked about and that's the trade for tyler o'neill um Mm -hmm. kind of under the radar after all of the other stuff he was really good in 2021 and he just hasn't been able to stay healthy but Gold Glove winner, got some MVP. But actually, he's a two-time Gold Glove winner. Do you see him as a starter, or do you see him as more of a, a platoon player? I see him looking back now with some distance between the trade as a why not type of thing because they gave up really nothing for him. Nick Robertson could be a Hall of Fame closer, and I'll have to eat my words. But like the way I look at it was, first of all, Santos was a minor league free agent. Those guys don't tend to have a lot of, uh, you know, trade value. So throw that out. And then Robertson was half of the return for a guy who was the worst player based on war in baseball when they traded him, Kike, at the deadline. And so to me, like Robertson's not a guy with a ton of value. I know he had some pretty good outings in September. He is, you know, just one of those nine arms I just talked about. That's Robertson and Yovera, they didn't make the opening day roster. You know, like that's kind of already how you could look at it. So for them, I think they just looked at the cost and said, this guy's got some upside. We'd rather have a righty in the mix. Um, You know, is there a chance if they go out and get Duvall or somebody else that 
O'Neill takes over maybe the ref Snyder um, role and they DFA ref Snyder and that shakes out that way. Maybe. Uh, is it, is there a chance that he becomes a starter based on, you know, maybe if they trade a Brayu and don't go out and add anybody or add more of a DH type like Solaire, who you don't really want in right field, obviously like maybe I think he gives them options, which is good. Um, and he was a depreciated asset, you know, in some of the ways Verdugo was, you know, two guys who have been kind of around for a while, um, you know, O'Neill got benched for hustle last year as well. I don't think the issues were as kind of common as they were with Verdugo. Um, and, but I think, you know, the upside on both players who have been kind of inconsistent is pretty similar. I think a right-hander just fit what they're trying to do a little bit more. Plus I think Verdugo's act would obviously run tired here, especially with Cora. So um, to me, like, that fits in the same mold as almost kind of the Schwarber move from a few years ago. It's we'll get the guy for the price. We like the deal and we'll figure out the rest of it later. You know, like Schwarber didn't have a place to play, but they didn't have to give up much for him. I know Ramirez was a good prospect at the time, but they, you know, clearly felt like it was okay. If he plays first, you know, maybe he'll catch again, but we don't know where he's going to go, but he's going to be here. That's how I feel like they feel about O'Neill and uh, you know, his role. Like I said, if they go out and they get, a power hitting outfielder and they don't make a trade if they don't include one of those guys in the you know in a trade for a pitcher then uh the role could be big it could be small i do know for a fact that they are actively shopping their outfielders across the board you know the yoshida thing i think is real if they could find somebody to take him um along with the guys i mentioned rafaela duran and a brave so um yeah, it'll be interesting. I think that's the high upside play. And again, it's not, and it's a pretty low risk because you didn't give up anything. And it's the last year of his deal. If Tyler O'Neill is DFA'd in August, would any be anybody be like supremely shocked? No. And if he's a Gold Glove, you know, would you be? So I think it's a very wide range of outcomes. Um, and again, they didn't give up enough where you can really, you know, be mad at them for going for it. Now, one more question before we go to uh, Andrew's rapid fire. But um, as I was mentioning earlier, the last big Twitter meltdown came over Teoscar Hernandez, which, to be fair, would have fit well for the Red Sox lineup as it's constructed right now. It really does look like they need somebody to put in that number three spot, presumably between Devers and Cassis. Do you believe that that comes from somebody that they already have, somebody that's a free agent, somebody they trade for? Who is going to make up that production that they're losing if... And, you know, he can be the answer to that, too. But Justin Turner's a free agent right now. Who is replacing that that right-handed bat? Yeah, I gave my take on this on Twitter the other night. And after being called the most miserable person on Red Sox Twitter for a month, I was all of a sudden the biggest homer for this take, which is actually a great barometer on if you're doing the job well. Being called <laughs> a miserable asshole all day long, and then now you're too team friendly. If you're getting both sides of that, you're doing it right. Um, Trevor Story, I think, has a chance to do it. I, people forget him for some reason. Uh, I think he's going to have a really good year. You know, I think they think that he was, his elbow was obviously, you know, the healing process was underway for that. Uh, and, you know, it's, yep, getting used to throwing with the new elbow, but also, you know, you're swinging with that. I know it's not, not the direct, you know, action or whatever, but I think that was a real thing. Um, with a full off season, with a healthy off season, taking on more of a leadership role, I think they're counting on him more than fans kind of want to admit from what I can gather. I know it's been a kind of a disappointing couple of years. The Red Sox always point to their record when he was on the field in 22. I think they were winning at like a 700 clip. They were a playoff team. Um, and so I think he has the chance to do that. Obviously, there's still power there. He's athletic. There's speed to add to that dimension. Um, I don't think people are really counting on him for that. But I, I would say, you know, there's a chance it's him. Solaire, to me, at this point, just feels like more of a DH. You're not going to put him in right field at Fenway. And, you know, uh, Tay Oscar for, you know, a short term deal, I think would have made sense when I was going on and on and on about how I didn't think he was a great fit because I thought he was going to get four for 75 or four, right. for 80, which they shouldn't have done. Um, but, you know, if they could have done two for, let's say two for, you know, 40 could have gotten the deal done. Maybe uh, you would have done that. So, um, so Lair feels like more of a DH. They want to rotate the DH spot more. And they're going to need it for Yoshida. Um, so I don't see that as much. I think that was a little overblown over the weekend. As of Monday, I heard not close at all. And there's a lot of teams in on them. And, you know, probably wait for the Teoscar dust to settle. Um, but my prediction would be story. And I, I think, like, people are underwhelmed when I beat this drum, too. And I've been saying it for weeks. But Duvall was really good. 
and he's going to cost you like the same he cost a year ago, you know? And like that to me for a team that's penny pinching, like they are uh, like the production's not that far off. Uh, if he stays healthy, you know, there's going to be times where he cannot make contact. There's going to be times where he homers every at bat. We saw that last year, but you know, the body of work last year, he had a pretty good year, especially if he can play a little bit of first base, maybe throw him in the mix there. So we're not going down the doll back path for the eighth straight year. Um, you know, like if he can do that, which is something he did earlier in his career and give Casas a rest against some lefties, you know, I think he fits the roster, you know, pretty well. Um, I, I still think, you know, I was always like Duvall over Teoscar for the price. I still think Duvall probably over Solaire for the price too, but have him slot in, you know, later in the lineup and, and have Story be that guy. They were, you know, pretty much out of it by the time he came back last year. So it didn't have a real impact on the season. Um, but I think Story's kind of, poised for a breakout year so you think story bats third duval bats sixth or something like that yeah yeah i mean i i would uh now that i've gone public with this theory they're not going to do it but uh <laughs> that makes some sense to me like i i think the upside of the story is still pretty high people have kind of given up on him um you know but he was he was pretty good when he was healthy other than the first month in 22 and this is also i've said this a billion times on different podcasts and stuff but have to mention my favorite Trevor Story related nugget of all time. I tweeted about how Red Sox fans had started thinking this guy was injury prone because he got hurt kind of on two freak things last year and then had the elbow issue, which he's been injury prone the last two years. And I was saying he was literally one of the most like, you know, post everyday guys in baseball when he was with the Rockies. <laughs> he played like almost 162 every year. And some guy, one of the great tweets of all time, what the hell are you talking about, Catillo? He missed almost all of 2020. He only played 58 games. <laughs> So take that Look. for what it is. Uh-huh. I'm going to take you non Red Sox for uh, a moment here. I got a few okay. questions. Um, I think I've seen you tweet about this too, or I might be getting it confused with somebody else, but I think you tweeted that you've been to every single ballpark besides one, three. I'm down to three. three. Yeah. Okay. So you've been to 27 cities mm -hmm. uh, on those. Whenever you're, I want to picture you in Smith and now McAdam possibly, but I want to picture it like you guys are in like a uh, fever pitch where there's a big board and you guys are all together and you're picking which series you want to travel to. I want to picture yep. that in my mind. So just don't tell me how you do it actually. That's pretty but, close. Um, where, when you, when the schedule comes out and you guys are choosing where you're traveling to, where's your like number one spot you want to go to? Yeah, that's a great question. It really is kind of the reverse. So Sean joined halfway through last year, and he picked up, I think, two road series. Uh, so it's mostly Smith and I. And so for the first five years, it was just the two of us. And we basically do 35 each and skip 10. And if they're out of it in September, then, you know, we can do it remotely. Uh, we didn't go to Cincinnati in September 22 when they were uh, out of it. But um, so the way it works is that Chris Smith is, in this way, the greatest beat partner of all time, where he just says, I don't care where I go. You tell me because I'm just going to be working my ass off the whole time. And you, if you want to go somewhere for social reasons or do this or that, like you pick and I'll fill it in. So like I was, you know, 22 when I started on the beat. And I remember in 2018, it was like, oh, Labor Day in Atlanta. I get friends down there. I'll make the long weekend out of it. Go to college football games. Uh, fourth of July in D.C., 11 a.m. start. Stay there for the fourth. Stay there for the fifth. And I was like going into this meeting prepared, like, all right, I got to tell Smith, you know, do you mind if I were to grab one of these? I know these are kind of the cool things on the schedule. He's like, you pick, I'll go to Detroit in August or, you know, I'll go to the trop whenever or can't, whatever the, you know, the midweek kind of slog in May series. And so, you know, I plan it around, uh, we, we do have a rule though. If you have not been, a, been to a ballpark, that's priority. Um, so he's down to just Pittsburgh. I have Pittsburgh, St. Louis and Arizona. So um, the Pittsburgh in April one is going to be a hot, hotly contested uh, item between the two of us. Um, but I would say just how I look at it now is I look at kind of, you know, if I can find a way to make a social trip out of it. And I find really crazy ways to bend that. Like in September, uh, my favorite one is I had to be in texas they're playing the rangers on a monday and that flight is like right on the line of do you go the day of the game or you go before so i was like all right i haven't done this all year i'll go sunday and then i looked at it and carolina football was playing home game against minnesota in chapel hill on saturday and i looked at a map and i said you know 
it's not on the way, but it's not not on the way. And so just those types of things where we stop over in Chapel Hill on the way to on the way to Texas, like I try to do those types of things um, or if there's different things that, you know, fit my schedule or um, and Smith has been great about that. So hopefully he doesn't decide that uh, he's going to really lay down the law this year because it's been great. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to assume it was like fever pitch where they have to look at the board and you got to like draw like something. I don't know. Yeah, but... I'm I I am. uh I think based on what we've talked about, they're going to the West or at least Smith is going to the West coast um, the first time. And so I am like, I'm all in on that Dodgers trip right after the all-star break and also Miami for the 4th of July. Cause I would like to melt. Can't be that. Um, no. All right. Second one. I, I asked this question for the first time to Rio Gomez when we had him on a few episodes back, but he's a big Arizona guy. So he's uh pretty through and through he's he was talking about you know doll back in college all that but you're obviously a big unc guy i don't you, you don't hide that so nope. um i asked him a question and he had to think a little bit but for you i want to know so you can give two answers your all-time favorite unc athlete any sport it can't be michael jordan um, and then when you were in college, who was your, it, it could be the same answer, I guess, but like, who was your athlete in college? Like when you were there? Yeah. I mean, I wasn't a, a fan of them growing up at all. I was a Notre Dame fan and I just, you know, when I started applying to schools, we went down and visit it Chapel Hill. I loved it. And so, um, you know, I became a fan the fall of 2014. So, uh, you know, people always like, are you big Hansborough guy? It's like, I don't, didn't watch him. I met him <laughs> once downtown, um, so, you know, I really have just the um, just the guys that I was there with. They they won the national title my junior year, so that team is very very special. Um, you know, a lot of guys that were really good in college and didn't really make it in the pros: Joel Berry, Theo Pinson, Justin Jackson, Kennedy Meeks. Uh, the year before, Bryce Johnson. Um, so I, I had you know I always say that like my time was really good across the board because we had you know those guys on the basketball team trubisky who i know was a bust was the number two overall pick my senior year and um gallon was there for baseball so uh, we kind of had across the three sports some some pretty good names and all of those um so i don't even know if i have a, a favorite all time um because you know it's going to be it's going to be drake may when he is drafted by the patriots in the fall or in the spring um Mike Vrabel, Drake, May 2024, mark it down. That'll be it. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I haven't been a fan long enough. And, yeah, the, like the Hansbro and Kendall Marshall and all those teams before me, they don't do anything for me. But big big game tonight against NC State, the Wolfpack. They're upset. Uh, they didn't get into Carolina, so they always turn out really well at that arena. Um, and uh, But, yeah, I, I love it. It's You know what? I do – I I get asked that a lot, and I know I'm intolerable with both that and the workshop ad spots remain on the on Twitter. But like when you are in this job and you're around it every day, like I was a huge Red Sox fan growing up, obviously not anymore. Like you kind of see how the sausage is made, use a disgusting phrase, and you see kind of how everything goes on in a major league organization and you lose that part of the rooting. And like I have really kind of lost Patriots the last couple of years, just, you know, knowing people who cover them and kind of how it's gone as an organization, like the Carolina basketball, especially something I can be completely removed from. I am the, you know, the, the bitchy fan on Twitter that, uh, you know, is talking about timeouts and that type of stuff and, you know, football for the first six weeks of every year before they collapse, that type of stuff. So, uh, when I get frustrated with Red Sox fans, like, Oh, why do they care this much? I just think about like, I'm literally scheduling my day around their Carolina game at eight o'clock tonight. And so I need to, you know, remember and reflect on, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's what it is for me versus what it is for them. It's a good perspective. And um, if we don't land Drake may, which I wouldn't hate at all, I'm still holding out hope that my guy drew Locke maybe comes in a trade. Um, that was my, I guess, well, he was my QB in college, so I still mm -hmm. hold him in very most, high regards. Most impressive post Monday Night Football interview of all time. It was, was incredible. Yeah, it was. Uh, I was shocked when I heard that because in college he was not like that. But third question, you kind of uh, segued into this a little bit, but your workshop it gets a uh, it's been getting a little heat on Twitter lately. Just uh, I guess spots remain. Whatever people are. I want to take the uh, HVT class personally. 
Yeah, that's okay. that delusion week one. Troll- I'm not no, the trolling seems like it would be good. I, I need yeah. that one. Mm-hmm. Well, my question was more geared towards how do you know the number of how many alumni you have? And then how do you keep track of everybody afterwards? Like to know what, what everybody's doing or do you even keep track? They go on their podcast like this. Uh, I, you know, I, I have spreadsheets. I do. Uh, my dad's a CPA, so I'm a spreadsheet and legal pad guy, despite being a writer. Um, and I, you know, I think it's probably about 200, 250. It started the fall of 2020. So um, we're in year four. Um, and there's people who are, you know, interested at different times, or obviously, you know, new college kids who are getting into it. Um, and, you know, it's been a cool side project. Uh, and I think, as you know, like I, I make it uh, a real um, priority to, you know, try to follow everybody and keep up with them and give pointers from afar after the workshop's over. So it's not like some, you know, money grab we do for three weeks and then never hear from them again, um, because I think that would be super shitty. And uh, I've also turned, you know, the curriculum of that class into a class at BC, which I um, am going back for my third semester. I did the fall of 22 and uh, last fall, and I'm going back in two weeks for the spring. And it basically is, you know, the workshop curriculum with assignments and with in-person guest speakers like Rich Hill has been nice enough to come both times, which has been awesome. Um, Cora zoomed in because he has a daughter that goes to BC. So he figured if I'm paying them all this money, I might as well zoom in. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's the whole goal of it, as you know, Andrew is just, it's not, you know, like the textbook, like here's associated press style and how to write a lead. It's like, all right, when I was 18 and 19, trying to get into this and trying to, you know, get sources and trying to find people like, this is how you actually do it. This is how you actually decide, like, do I have a story or not? Um, you know, and I use the examples of all the times where I've thought I've had something and it's been wrong and I didn't report it because I wasn't 100 percent or these are the types of stories you need to put in your portfolio. I mean, I've said it to a billion people over and over and over again. You know, so many people get into this and they write, here are my Super Bowl predictions or here are my thoughts on what the Red Sox should do. And there's literally probably thousands of places you can find that on the Internet. But if you go write the kick-ass feature story or do a great podcast with this minor leaguer who no one's ever heard of, but they have an amazing story, like that's the stuff that stands out. That's the stuff that gets play. You know, like I always talk to Chris and, you know, about what you guys have done and like, you know, you do it the right way of like, okay, and this podcast included, especially this episode, like you're not always getting the big name. It doesn't mean, you know, it's not going to be entertaining or good or whatever. Um, you know, like I, I think back to some of the stories I've done, like would a feature on David Ortiz automatically drive eyeball? Sure. But also like, look at what Chris Smith does with the 40th man on the roster. People are really interested in that stuff if the story's good. So that's kind of what I try to talk about in the workshop. I've really enjoyed it. Um, there's a lot of people, you know, that have come through and been really, really successful, not because of anything I've done, because they put in the work on their own. Um, but it's been it's been cool to kind of do that on the side and kind of get away from the day to day of the sock stuff. And obviously, you know, teaching in a college class, I, I've always said I'm the least qualified adjunct BC's ever employed. But uh, it's <laughs> fun to go to campus and like teach a class and try to do it differently. Um, and, you know, that doesn't mean like next weekend, uh, Carolina's playing BC and, and basketball there. And despite getting paid by them to be an adjunct, I will not wear their colors to that game. So, uh, you know, the, they, they're only ACC in name only. Um, and, uh, but it's been fun. I have one last question before we shoot it to Ed to kind of empty the bench to round us off here, but, um, it is the most important question. I don't know if you know what's coming. I don't. Um, Okay, cool. Because um, Zach Kelly knew it was coming, and I don't know how. So um, way to tell us you've never listened to this show, Chris. Uh, I listened to everything, so you know it's all. Well, listen, locked. Zach Kelly has never listened to the show, and he knew. So I'm kind of like I'm, I'm a little. It's a little sus, but they call people friend of a program. Zach Kelly's the friend of every program. That's okay, fair, yeah. but um, all right, beloved, so, completely agree. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. Okay, you're hungry. You Correct. are going to go get in your car with your driver's license that you do have now. Don't have. No, still no. don't have. Okay. No. Um, then Waste you're going to get Uber everywhere. Fine. You're going to get, 
mom's gonna drive you to a drive through okay mm-hmm. everything is an option everything's open um but you want fast food fried chicken it's gotta be a drive through where okay. are you going where is she taking you it's gonna be a long ride uh because we are going to pdq it is stands for people dedicated to quality it's a chain in florida and the carolinas and it is beyond elite if uh i tweeted to them once and they said we appreciate someone in the north appreciating us and they mailed me gift cards which was great next next time i was down in the carolinas i used them yeah they are there's there's one in fort myers that i really don't access a lot when i'm when i'm down there i'm trying to see where the the closest one is uh i don't think there's Fort myers by the way wow yeah uh so florida they're everywhere North Carolina, there's two in New Jersey, or one in New Jersey, two in New York, and two in South Carolina. But I mean, the Florida everywhere, um, you know, there are two in Fort Myers. So that is that is the that is the answer, and it's not even close. Where John somebody Schreiber. said we had that one somewhat recently, and it, but we John haven't Schreiber. heard it a ton. Like who was that? John Schreiber. He told us that that place was it was Schreiber and somebody else. I don't remember who it was, but everybody's been hyping that place up. That's on my list when I get down there uh, in February. But I know there's a Zaxby's like not even a mile from the place. That's where I'll be. Me and Alex Benellis will be there all day. Zaxby's is like the Atlantic League compared to PDQ. Oh, wow. Oh, I, right. I don't think Parker's um, going to like that. All right. Well. Ed, we're we're emptying the bench here. Um, I'm ba- I'm still batting like two for fifty on Zaxby's. We'll, yeah, we'll get him. but yeah, uh, we're, Ed, we're working on. It. You're gonna go on a you're gonna go on a hitting streak and boost that batting average. We both know it. Uh, yeah. Um, so you you had a bunch of news about winter weekend today. Um, ownership is in. Are, are they just not gonna? be there or are they just not talking like what's they had that open house or, or last year or whatever it was the town hall what's it gonna look like this year is it just like the jonathan papelbon show like what, what yeah, what's happening that was um you know i noticed that it said welcome event on the site uh and thought it was interesting today they sent a press release that they're going to introduce the players like they've done every year and then papelbon's going to host a talk show with tom karen and uh, who knows who's going to be on the stage? I mean, I would guess Cora and Breslow are going to be up there. I don't think there's any way in which, you know, Henry um, sits up on the stage. He gets to make that decision. Uh, he's rich enough to make that decision. He won't be passive aggressively checking his watch this year, which is good. Um, you know, I think it's, it's just an unbelievably predictable event, like turn of events here, like that the fact that they were not. Um, you know, they're, they might paint it officially as, well, we just thought this would be a more fun way for, you know, the fans to get introduced to winter weekend. There's no way it's not correlated with what happened last year. I wasn't there. I was at a bachelor party. I remember like looking at the videos and being like, holy shit, did this really happen there? Oh, oh my God. Um, but uh, it's going to be, I think, less interesting. And, uh, you know, it's, I think they're self aware to realize, uh, self aware enough that, they just can't do that again. Um, and I think it's a real thing, you know, like I, people might look at that storyline. Like I wrote it for the site as like, Oh, who cares? It's just some winter event. Like, tell me who they're signing. But like you kind of look at public perception and everything, like the reaction from Red Sox fans was so bad. And as Sean has pointed out on, on the pod and is a great point that I always think about, these aren't your like, casual fans or kind of like generally miserable people like these are your like have nine jerseys make the trek to springfield which is inconvenient for everybody uh like you know still think bobby dahlbeck's gonna be the mvp people like these are the diehards and those are the people booing you those are the people you can't face i mean that's where they are and i think at least they recognize that um and but the fact that they have to like Okay, we can't do that. You just imagine the meeting. We can't do the town hall. Like maybe Jonathan Papelbaum will host a show and we they won't boo him. Like <laughs> think about that. That it's it's just when you peel back, I know you asked big picture questions earlier, Ed. Like it's it's crazy times. Yeah, I can't remember. I've been I've been a Red Sox fan since 1996, 1997. It's been a long time since I, people have been this pissed off about anything. Yeah, I mean, I see that all the time on Twitter, right? Like, that's it's just what it is. Um, and, you know, I think, again, a, a big part of it is just the the messaging is not there. Um, 
the full throttle thing is is going to live in infamy. And the next time Warner talks in 2040, you know, we're going to have to ask him about what he meant by that. <laughs> well, Chris, I was going to say you, you didn't get to experience it last year. I knew you were off uh, at a trip, but um, I was hoping you were going to get to see the town hall this year. And uh, I, I think they just had to out of safety. Like, I mean, last year there was just booze, but you have no idea. It's 2024. Like people will do anything like crazy people are everywhere. Yeah, but, um, I will be. I will be there for Jonathan Papelbon's talk show. So, <laughs> I'm gonna wait. be there, but I'm, I'm not gonna. Spoilers, not gonna be anything close to sober for it. <laughs> wow. I'll be on the. Right. I'll be on. I'll be on the clock. So that'll be. I <laughs> well, mean, I expect you're, you're to see you. You're a professional guy. That's right. I expect to see you running tables. I know uh, Zach Kelly has offered. Um, I know that Josh Winkowski is gonna be chugging White Claws with us again. Um, so we'll, we'll see where the night takes us, but did we Chris, you gave, uh, the Zach Kelly thing is confirmed. The Joe, so I, knew Zach, I was there for Zach, but his wig, Josh is ready for round two. So oh, let's go. Um, it's, uh, but Chris, you've given us a ton of time. We're just under an hour, but, uh, I know you got a UNC in a couple hours, but, uh, we appreciate all the time. Yeah, we will, uh, see you next weekend, but we, uh, thank you for hopping on. Sounds good. You guys might need to carry me around the casino, but I appreciate it.